Hello, and welcome to Battery Metals Panel, hosted by SIX. We are joined today with the leaders of three leading mining and exploration companies within the battery metals space. I'm pleased to introduce you to Bharat Parashar, Chairman and CEO of Cylon Graphite, Justin Brown, Managing Director of Element 25, and Ali Haji, CEO and Director of Ion Energy. In this panel, we're going to hear insights into the impact of the global acceleration away from fossil fuels has on each of these leaders' companies, as well as the commodities they focus on. As a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time on the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll open the floor up to live Q&A afterwards. All right, so to kick us off, welcome everyone. Can you, um, Bharat, please just introduce yourself and your company? Good morning to all. Uh, my name is uh, Bharat Barasha, and I am uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Ceylon Graphite, a TSXV uh, listed company. Uh, we were established in uh, 2017 uh, and are involved in the production and exploration of graphite uh, in the mystical island of Sri Lanka. And I can proudly say that uh, we are one of the new entrants uh, to the Producers Club. Uh, our mission uh, is to be a low cost, low impact global supplier of the highest quality graphite products uh, to a rapidly growing energy storage market. Uh, and that's our mission right now. Our missions and mission statements tend to move. Uh, I'd rather go by my mantra right now, which is production, production, production. Uh, as we go on, I'll tell you how this is going to change. But uh, we are, as I said, situated in Sri Lanka, where we are lucky to have the highest grade in situ graphite uh, in the world at 90% uh, carbon content. Uh, graphite, as you know, is all about purity. Purity is measured uh, by the carbon content. Uh, what differentiates us from the others, really, uh, in terms of natural graphite, is we have vein graphite, as I mentioned, and vein graphite, very different from flake graphite. Flake graphite is uh, like you see in the old Western movies, a piece of stone uh, with a few flakes of graphite on it. Uh, our graphite is just like the graphite you have, like the veins uh, and blood in your arm. Uh, it's it, hundreds of years ago, or maybe millions of years ago, it was a liquid coming up to the surface uh, from the core of the earth, and it's now solidified. And when we mine this, we mine this in blocks. So we do not have the additional costs of flotation, separation, uh, and concentration, and others. Uh, as of right now, we have uh, one of our mines, the K1 mine, which you might hear of from time to time and read about in the newspaper in commercial production. Uh, at a fully ramped up basis, that will be 5,000 tons per annum. Uh, we have our second mine, which is the M1 mine, which we hope uh, to be in production by the end of uh, the second quarter, early third quarter of the year. Uh, we have a huge uh, land mass uh, available to us. Uh, in layman's terms, it's about 30,000 acres. Uh, in, in more specificity, uh, we have 121 grids uh, that have been given to us uh, by the uh, local regulator in Sri Lanka. And each grid is about one square kilometer. Our production costs are maybe amongst the lowest in the world, at around 200 to $220 a ton. Uh, we break even on small cash flows. Uh, and the beauty of our product is that it sells in the world markets uh, for a premium compared to the rest of of the graphite, the flake graphite sells, the best quality flake graphite sells for about $1,400 a ton. And our 90% to 95% carbon content vein sells at about $2,000 a ton. And as we get up the purity scale, obviously our graphite's our selling price improves. <coughs> uh, 
another important thing to keep in mind is most of the graphite in the world right now comes from uh, China. Uh, and uh, we will provide the world uh, uh, and the energy storage supply chain a, a diversified, uh, we, uh, uh, some diversity in, in the sourcing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, uh, our mantra is production, production, production right now, but our real intent is to become a technology company. Uh, and that will happen three, four years down the road uh, when we graduate from just producing natural graphite to, to providing the processed product. And to that end, uh, we have uh, put in the missing piece in the puzzle a couple of weeks ago. You may have read that we have hired two globally renowned scientists who've got uh, uh, over 30 patents uh, between them. Uh, they bring extensive experience in the development of graphite and graphene products. And, and we as a company aim to capitalize uh, on their technical expertise and innovative abilities to advance the development and most importantly, commercialization of new technologies within our product range. Uh, so that's a little a blurb about us. Uh, we are listed on the T, uh, on, as I said, on the TSX uh, Venture Board. Uh, our stock has been doing pretty well over the last couple of days. Uh, I think we opened uh, at 51 cents this morning and have gone up a little bit. Uh, we've had an extraordinary ride over the last couple of months, which we hope to continue. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Coming all the way from Australia, Justin, can you please tell us a bit about Element 25? Thanks, Dasha. Sure. So, um, yeah, on the other side of the world, I guess, we're building a manganese project in the southern Pilbara region of Western Australia. Um, we're about halfway through the construction of the first stage of development. We plan to be in production, producing a medium-grade concentrate product, manganese concentrate product uh, for export to the steel industry, sort of in basically the back end of this quarter. Um, that's very much the first stage of development in what we intend to be a much longer journey which takes us into the battery chemical space. We have a, a flow sheet that's well advanced in development that can produce battery grade manganese sulfate and high purity manganese metal. Um, this first stage is very much a low capital avenue to get cash flow established so that we can fund the growth of the business through the chemical manganese um, space. Um, obviously, being in Western Australia, we're uh, regarded as a tier one jurisdiction. There's quite a lot of interest in supplying the world's need for battery materials in jurisdictions that have an ethically and environmentally well regulated mining jurisdiction, which is becoming more important to the and users of these products and we, we fit that bill quite nicely. Um, so we're we're sort of, I guess we're on an express journey from being a, a junior ASX listed exploration company to a um, what we hope ultimately will be a globally significant um, chemical manganese business. Um, we have a very large resource, so we're not constrained by the typical limitations on the, 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 the volume of the resource that we have. It's about 263 million tons in Jork resource at the moment. It's at surface, it's very low cost, cheap mining. Um, as I said, a well-regulated mining jurisdiction in Western Australia, so been well received by off-takers. We've got a five-year take or pay off-take agreement with OM Materials, which is a subsidiary of OM Holdings, who have smelting facilities in, in Sarawak. Um, and yeah, beyond this first stage, a lot of growth ap appetite to, uh, to, to fill the gap in, in what we see coming in the manganese chemical space, because I think Manganese is, is going to become increasingly important in, in battery chemistries as the world seeks to electrify. Um, you can't probably do it with nickel and cobalt alone. You most certainly can't do it with cobalt. Um, manganese is going to become more dominant and we plan to be a, a significant player in that, in that growth. Wonderful. Thank you. And Ali, please introduce yourself and Ion Energy. Thanks, Dasha. Good to be here with Justin and Bharat. Um, Ion Energy is a company that I co-founded in 2017 uh, at the tail end of the last lithium cycle with the sole intent of uh, looking for lithium in Mongolia, uh, Mongolia, a jurisdiction that is uh, vastly under um, understood and uh, it is one that we have a significant amount of experience in. 
Uh, we started the company back in 2017, looking at uh, battery metals, making a comeback, uh, thankfully, or um, unfortunately, given the circumstances. Uh, COVID and the governments around the world have, have uh, you know, increased spending and, and recovery funds for a greener recovery. That, in turn, has brought uh, this panel to the discussion today. And uh, the growth in the segment has allowed us to really capitalize on our experience in country. So we were awarded in uh, 2019 uh, an 81,000 hectare license in the South Gobi region of the company of the country. It is the largest land package ever granted by the government of Mongolia to a private or public company. It sits in a very arid environment uh, with geology that very much mirrors what you would find in the lithium triangle. Uh, we added to our team over the course of the last six months with some industry titans, uh, including the original chairman of Lithium Americas, some technical folks as well, uh, and more recently, as of last week, uh, Dr. Hashbat Dashtitsarin, who is the only PhD lithium hydrogeologist in Mongolia. So our focus today remains uh, exploration and de risking our existing assets via exploration. Uh, we commenced our exploration program last October. We expect to put out results to market in short order here. Uh, but the ultimate goal of uh, our, our company is to be able to secure a significant amount of the lithium that's available in Mongolia. And based on our understanding, there is a vast amount and ultimately work with the majors and strategics around the world to develop an off-take agreement or ultimate JV uh, type scenario in the years to come. So a lot of exciting progress to follow. And I think uh, you, you'd see that in the battery metal space, but also our share price has done a fair bit of improvement over the last uh, few months to reflect that. Thank you. Great. So going around the virtual room in the same order, can you tell us why your commodity is critical to the movement away from carbon fuels to electricity? Starting with you, Barack. I'd say we should talk about movement away from hydrocarbons and decarbonization, but let me start off uh, for those who don't know, what is graphite? Uh, you know, graphite is an allotrope of carbon, uh, six molecules of uh, carbon in a hexagonal shape. Uh, and um, as I mentioned, there are basically three types of uh, graphite flake, which is the predominant form in the world, vein. Uh, and um, amorphous uh, uh, flake. Uh, um, uh, the only one I didn't talk about is amorphous. Amorphous is very little in, uh, in, in production in the world, and it is primarily a seam in a rock uh, and difficult to find. But in the, what is the biggest sort of source of demand uh, uh, for us uh, right now? And uh, if you look at numbers, uh, there's about 800,000 tons uh, of natural graphite uh, that is being uh, produced uh, in the world today, uh, of which 200,000 tons uh, is being uh, driven by what, you know, the, the famous EV market. However, uh, forecasters like BMI, which is Benchmark Minerals and others, think that by 2030, when all these governments, including the United States government and President Biden's big energy plan come to fruition, uh, the demand uh, for natural graphite will be about 4 million tons per annum. Uh, and uh, <coughs> of this 3 million tons uh, will be driven uh, by uh, the um, electric vehicle market. Now this is gonna cause a big graphite deficit around the world. Uh, and uh, I think that all these numbers are a little bit of humbug, actually, because uh, development is taking uh, pace at a much uh, quicker uh, level uh, than it uh, is actually anticipated. Uh, and uh, you're going to see the graphite deficit start off in a, another three or four years versus 10 years that people have anticipated. Uh, the, the graphite is basically used uh, in a battery or in any energy storage uh, cell in the anode. Uh, and uh, I'm sure most of you have heard what uh, the great renewable energy pioneer uh, Elon Musk has said, and he basically says that uh, the cells should be called nickel graphite uh, because the cathode is uh, primarily nickel uh, and the anode side is graphite with a little bit of silicon. Uh, and lithium here is used like salt on a salad. Now, I'm sure uh, Ali might, uh, uh, Mr. Haji might uh, disagree, but uh, that's uh, the way we look at it. Um, and uh, th there's been a big evolution in, in, the, in the battery business and battery mega uh, factories are 
coming up all around the world. A typical mega factory, you know, that does about 30 gigawatts uh, of uh, battery a year consumes about 33,000 tons uh, of refined graphite a year. And that's, uh, in terms of raw natural graphite, that's closer to 40, 45,000. Because when you process the product, uh, you have uh, about a 75% uh, weight uh, uh, loss. Uh, just a, a trivia question for people, you know, and, and I'm sure a lot of you drive Teslas. Uh, a typical Tesla has 71 kilos of graphite in it. Uh, and if you look at all these new electric cars, uh, the smallest one, I think, is the E uh, Golf, the one that's made by Volkswagen. And that has about 26 to 28 kilos uh, of, uh, of graphite. So graphite is a very important part of this whole EV cycle. Uh, and um, we uh, view uh, as a company that given that our graphite is you know, the purest on, uh, on, on the planet or has the highest grade in situ, uh, we will be able to uh, take advantage of this great uh, generational shift uh, that is taking place in terms of moving from uh, hydrocarbon uh, transportation and uh, energy towards a renewable energy. I think personally that the bigger opportunity is not going to be uh, energy, uh, sorry, the electric vehicles, uh, but energy storage. Uh, in, I, I'm a firm believer that in my lifetime, at least if I'm older than most of you on the on the on the panel here, uh, we are going to see a complete change in terms of how we look at uh, power and electricity generation at home. Uh, I, I'm fairly confident, at least in California and other places, we are going to be all solar, and each house is going to have a shoebox sized battery and that battery is going to be able to give you in month or more than a month's electricity and power for your domestic use and all these big uh, utilities and transmission companies are just going to be back up uh, and if you go into the actual uh, scientific developments that are taking place right now you will see uh, new batteries that are coming up that are just amazing uh, I've been to one of these OEM factories uh, where we've seen the new car batteries that are coming up and you must have all heard about the original Tesla batteries which were made and, uh, the, too much silicon in the in the anode caused it to heat up and the silicon expands and uh, it caught fire. But people are coming to grips with that technology and you're going to see more and more evolution uh, and the use of a silicon wrap that's actually making sense, plus the transformation uh, of using a bit of graphene, uh, just coming. I know people say you haven't commercially done it, but it's coming. Uh, and we are going to see, we are see, going to see batteries the size of a lipstick, which I'm sure, Dasha, you are familiar with. And, uh, and you know, five or six or 10 of these batteries uh, are, are going to charge the motor car, uh, which has greater, uh, um, storage and energy capacity than what they currently have. So this business is rapidly moving forward. Uh, and and I, I, I think the evolution is going to be faster than uh, the mobile phone, telephone. I remember in 1990, I used to have a brick. And when somebody <laughs> told me that, oh, you can use the same telephone number in New York or London, I said, ah, you're crazy. But you know, uh, by 1993, we were running around the world with roaming, this, that, and the other. And today, we, you know, we're talking to each other on the computer, uh, something that people couldn't have imagined 20 years ago. So evolution is going to be very fast, and, and, and our product, Graphite, and its upgraded and processed versions are going to be a key to this uh, process. Very interesting. Thank you. Justin. Um, tell us how your commodity is critical to the movement away from carbon fuels to electricity. Yes, I think Barat's done a good job of laying the, the, the foundations, I guess, for the, for the electrification story. And I agree with him that EVs are the, the first step in a much longer journey around storage, um, the decentralized grid and so forth. I think that where manganese fits into this is that um, it's, it's the one metal that actually is the most, in terms of the cathode materials, is the most 
common and the cheapest. So I think that it's inevitable that it plays a really big role in, in that transition. I think some of the other metals have supply constraints that manganese doesn't suffer from. If you can be a you know bottom half quartile or bottom, bottom half or bottom quartile cost producer in any of these high purity chemical spaces, I think you stand a really good shot at doing very, very well over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, I don't know. My crystal ball is not as good as Barat's. I think he's probably right that the acceleration will be faster than we expect. If you look at the targets in Europe um, and China, you know the, the, the rate at which the societies intend to decarbonise is, is quite astronomical. And to do that, you know, any of the forecasts are all slightly different, but they all forecast a demand for huge volumes of these materials, whether it be lithium, nickel, graphite, manganese or, or cobalt, although cobalt perhaps the the poor cousin because whilst it's important in batteries it's also the, the the least available and so people are moving away from it where they can um so i think manganese um is a really prime candidate to to help with that transition to an electrified society um away from fossil fuels um i think it's going to be important to do it in a, in, a, in a low carbon intensity fashion and i think western australia has really really good opportunities there and renewables we've got a fantastic solar resource we've done quite a lot of work at our project showing we've got a fantastic wind resource as well um, and I think we're well placed obviously we've got fantastic mineral endowment also um, and I think WA has got a really exciting future in producing low to zero carbon battery uh, chemicals that are going to they're going to allow this transition to take place so yeah look I think I think um, I'll keep it brief for them Brady did he did the groundwork for me but um, I think all of these all of these uh, commodities have a, have a really important role to play going forward, including manganese. Great, Ali. What are your thoughts? Thanks, uh, Dasha. Yeah, I'd echo Barrett and Justin's comments. I think, as far as the salt on the salad is concerned, one would not eat salt without the salad, <laughs> and therefore, uh, or rather, one would not eat the salad without the salt. It would, so it would lend itself to a very dull salad, um, and, and that sort of um, alludes to my my comment regarding lithium and aquamarine battery. You look at fossil fuels, we talk about carbon, and, and you know, to think about where the lithium ion battery found its origins, uh, that was Exxon in the 70s, Dr. Whittingham and Dr. Goodenough. They were hired by Exxon to produce these batteries, and the lithium ion battery has been in production since uh, the 70s. So much like your telephone, you know, these things get improved and that silicone uh, flammability, what, uh, what have you, tends to reduce over time in iterations of improvement. Uh, but I think, you know, lithium, that said will exist in every battery technology going forward be it lithium ion or lithium ferrophosphate it is a critical component of those batteries as is manganese and graphite now when we talk about storage uh, and the like i think i i, I do agree with you Bharat. Uh, the world is moving in that direction um, and you look at the renewable sense that you mentioned justin in western australia uh, Mongolia has one of the largest wind farms anywhere in the world, uh, and we're operating not too far from there. Um, and as a result, the, the solar power that is being provided to the country, uh, as well as the wind power, lends itself very well for infrastructure that ION may use to bring our site to production. So I think in short, uh, again, lithium is a, a critical component of battery metals, as are manganese and graphite. Uh, and looking at the demand and supply curves internationally, Justin made a very good point that you know prices are increasing um, and they have done so more rapidly than we've seen in the past as a result of this green revolution. Uh, particularly, I think, uh, you know, benchmark, we mentioned that part, uh, the benchmark index very recently put out uh, the fact that lithium carbonate equivalent uh, has a price spike in China. China today consumes 53% of the world's lithium. Uh, they produce 73% of the world's batteries. They refine 80% of the lithium that goes in batteries worldwide. And as a result of that, you could see that this early warning system of this glut in supply is really kicking in. So I think it's important to note that the world is moving in this direction. And it's more important to note that the early warning system in China is shining brightly. So I uh, absolutely agree with both my speakers here today. Great. So we touched on it a bit, but there is a lot of talk about your commodities, various applications to electric vehicles, but what other products do you see acting as additional catalysts or complementary product to EVs with respect to your individual commodities? Barat? Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a good point here. What else is graphite used for? And uh, what, else, what else has uh, graphite... Uh, uh, famous for well, you know, the most famous use of graphite, I suppose, was the graphite pencil. Uh, but, but uh, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it, whilst 
most of us know about that, it's, it's not particularly true. Uh, graphite is used uh, all over the world. It started off, obviously, uh, in, uh, as a military product because it's, it's the best lubricant. And it's also the best conductor of heat and energy. Uh, so the military used it in all their large uh, guns and, uh, you know, the big barrel howitzers and tanks and everything else as a lubricant simply because if the heat was not controlled as the, as the armament uh, flashed through, the, the barrel would explode. Uh, from that basic use, obviously, it's also been used uh, in refractories. It's been used in uh, the steel business in a big way. Uh, if you look at the electric arc furnace, your electrodes uh, there that provide the heat are predominantly synthetic graphite or very, very pure natural graphite. Uh, it's used uh, for composites in aircraft and jet aircraft. Uh, it's used for coatings and inks. Uh, it's used in smart materials. And obviously, the big uh, uh, use of the future is going to be, uh, hopefully, graphene. Uh, and graphene, as you know, is supposedly the is a single molecule uh, uh, product, which is going to it's the strongest so-called strongest product in the world, uh, and is going to revolutionize. Uh, at least it's pointing in that direction. A lot of the things we do, so it has multiple uh, it has multiple uses, uh, and uh, you know, the, the the issue though is how do you differentiate and where do you use the product. Uh, the purer in today's market, on the far end of one side, the purer graphite that you have, obviously, with the best return on your equity and in your capital, is in the in the energy business, in the energy storage business, or whether it's in the battery lithium-ion batteries or in the storage cells. And as you get less and less technical in in requirement, you can use more uh, you know inferior quality product, uh, but. Uh, I think, uh, as as we've all noted here, uh, there's a lot of scope uh, uh, for the product, uh, and uh, there's going to be a huge demand deficit. I mean, the, the, there's going to be sub sorry supply deficit by your part, and and you're going to just uh, have to find uh, appropriate substitutes. But substitute for natural graphite is synthetic graphite which sells, or at least pre-COVID, I must uh, just clarify that, uh, pre-COVID was three times the price of, of uh, natural graphite. Synthetic graphite was selling on a f at about $15,000 a ton, and uh, completely expanded refined graphite at 99.99% carbon content was selling for about five and a half, six thousand dollars $6,000. So there's a, you know, there's a huge difference in that. But, I, I let my uh, co-panelists uh, here uh, give some uh, other ideas about where these products can be used. Great. Uh, Justin, what about for manganese? Yeah, it's, it's again, it's, it's not a dissimilar story. Manganese has been around for a long time. It's the fourth largest traded commodity globally. Um, and the main reason for that is that it's, it's in all steel. Um, so basically, traditionally, it goes in lockstep with, with economic growth, which, which uh, drives steel consumption um, in developing societies. Um, and so that's been the mainstay, I guess, for manganese. It's also used in quite a number of exotic alloys and, and aerospace materials and things. Um, and I guess the battery consumption side of it is is sort of a new market i mean it's been used in batteries for for 30 or 40 years as well your, your average duracell double a battery has quite a lot of manganese in it um but the lithium ion applications are sort of relatively new um although getting getting more mature as, as we move forward um but i think that's the exciting part you've got this sort of main this 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 uh, base load demand in the steel industry and the, the other exotic alloy industry and then you've got this really exciting steep growth um, in the battery sector and, and I think you know but if you look at an EV um, you know you, you need steel without manganese you can't make steel so there's quite a lot of manganese that, that, that fits into these things um, it also fits into the storage markets um, that we're at was touching on before um, you know it's 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 quite a uh, widely available uh, commodity so what that means is it's not constrained as much by some of the supply side bottlenecks that perhaps some of the other metals have. So what you need to do is be a low cost producer. That's going to be the key to success. Um, fortunately for Element 25, we fit comfortably into that 
that bottom half of the cost curve. So we should be in pretty good shape to be competitive throughout all parts of the cycle. Um, but yeah, look, manganese is a, is, a, is a big part of the, the, the world. If you want economic activity, you need manganese and, and um, it's a good space to be in, I think. Um, and only made more exciting by, the, by the, the battery demand side of things as well. All right, and you, Ali? I'm gonna, Your thoughts? I'm gonna put that on its head and add some humor to this conversation. I think, uh, you know, lithium has been around for, for <laughs> a while, but primarily for battery use. Uh, the other uh, use that may or may not be known by the broader audience is that of uh, maintaining mental stability. So it is used to treat schizophrenia. And I think as you start to reduce the cost of power to under $100 per kilowatt hour, um, your stress levels will reduce and thus lithium will have less use in the medical industry. So I would like to say that, you know, lithium is uh, going to continue to be in demand, as we've said, uh, but I think uh, as far as additional uses and catalysts in that regard, I don't see much, uh, much movement at all. All right. What emerging trends do you see in lithium, manganese, and graphite market markets that you think investors and stakeholders should be monitoring? Or uh, you know, that's a, that's a $10 gazillion question. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think that uh, I can really answer that uh, appropriately. There are lots of smarter people than me around, but from, from Salon Graphite's perspective, uh, you're going to see the market really move. First of all, I think we should go back to the basics. Uh, there's going to be a huge supply deficit uh, for products, but people are going to get drawn more and more towards uh, the high-end product, obviously, because uh, it's... Um, it's um, going to give better returns. So you're going to have to look a lot at your cost and how you manage these costs. In, in our case, we are lucky. We are uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, yes, we are an underground mining company. So we have a little more uh, expense than maybe someone who does straightforward uh, open pit mining. But our product allows us to move away from that and give us the advantage given that we are vein graphite. Uh, once you get the graphite out of the ground, I think as you differentiate yourself with the complexity of the product that you you provide, the market is gonna provide the big difference. So either you're going to, you've got a process upgrade, you're going to expand it graphite, or you're going to spheronize graphite, or you go coated, uncoated. I mean, this is all technical jargon, but basically, uh, when you build your anodes uh, for for your batteries, apart from the manganese and lithium and other things that you put into these various components, you've got to take, your graphite has to be spheronized, put into small little spheres, and then put it to create the anode. And um, right now, the world is still shaking up a bit. It's like the old Betamax VHS stuff, you know? Whoever manufactures his own anode has his own specs. But I think you're going to have a rationalization that takes place over time. And the use of the product will become a lot easier, number one. But the, the quality of the product will have to move up. So people are going to go for the higher and higher product in terms of carbon and in terms of conductivity, because that's what's going to give them the edge in their, in their, in their product, which is, you know, someone like Panasonic, or Tesla, or whoever, you know, Ford or GM, or whoever uses this stuff. So I think um, there's going to be a lot of innovation in that side. And we as producers of the product, even though we take the raw form and bring it up there, are going to have to do a lot more uh, to, to, to get uh, to what the end user demands. Great. To Justin? Yeah, I second that. I think quality is going to be really important. I think these these gigafactories don't want to be qualifying every cargo they get. They want you to be able to produce consistent quality, you know, month in, month out. Um, I think cost is going to be really important. You know, you, people talk about $100 a kilowatt hour being sort of a critical threshold for comp or direct uh, cost competition with ICE cars. But you know, I've been reading some material recently that suggests it may even be sort of down at the $75 kilowatt hour or $50 kilowatt hour. 
um, before it really gets to that level. So I think that I think cost is important. I think quality is going to be important. I think that another trend which we've sort of touched on a little bit is the decarbonisation. I think you know if, if people are going to um, have EVs and power them with solar or wind. Um, you know, it's important to them that their materials they put in their batteries are going to be ethically produced in a low carbon environment. Um, supply chain transparency is going to become important. So I think jurisdictional sort of uh, questions are going to come to the fore more. And you need to be able to show that you're in control of those, those variables in terms of ethical labor rules and environmental constraints and low carbon uh, you know, operations and things like that. So I think there's a number of converging threads that are going to they're going to drive a lot of decision making in the next sort of five ten fifteen years um and people need to be paying attention to some of that stuff if they want to be successful in this in this new world yeah well put John. all right <laughs> uh, and yeah, after you, Ali. Yeah, I was going to, you know, echo Justin and Bart's uh, sentiments there. I think, uh, you know, ha having things sourced ethically and also the quality is extremely important. Obviously, a cost perspective is extremely important as well. Uh, Mongolia, being a country that that is very mining focused, allows uh, a, a number of skilled laborers to be in country that helps you keep your costs low. But I think. Uh, you know, with lithium batteries in general, whether it's lithium ion or lithium ferrophosphate, and with lithium ferrophosphate, we've seen uh, the likes of uh, Tesla rolling out all Model 3s using that battery in China and 10 European markets. It's increased the range of the battery from 100,000 miles to a million miles until it requires replacement, uh, and that's fantastic. Uh, but one thing that's understated, I think, continually in our industry is recycling. Uh, when these batteries come to the end of life, they need to be recycled economically without hazardous waste and re-put into that supply chain. So that's something that I think we should be monitoring quite well as investors and as consumers. Uh, in addition to that, you can expect to see a vast amount of improvement uh, as far as the actual range and, and lifelong of that battery uh, as we continue. Absolutely. Thank you. So this is the last question here, and then we'll open the floor to Q&A. So please remember to keep, continue to submit your questions under the Q&A tab. So what is the commitment to the regulatory authorities in each of your operating jurisdictions like? And how do you think that might change going forward as it relates to your operations? Oh, uh, Duffy, <laughs> another Duffy. Well, you know, I, I must say, uh, I must say, uh, and, and I must be uh, very thankful that we are in Sri Lanka uh, and not in uh, some of these other jurisdictions where regulations uh, have changed. Uh, because one of the biggest risks you face in any business, and particularly in the mining business, is regulatory risk. And regulations changing all the time can kill your business. Uh, but our regulator in Sri Lanka is uh, the GSMB, or the Geological Survey and Mines Bureau of the country. Uh, I, I, I'll say this, I've been doing this with them uh, for a few years now. Uh, we've been, we were investors in Sri Lanka in, in, in something else in the civil war and and uh, uh, and now in the in the mines side they've been very consistent in their approach yes they're a bit long but then to get a mining license in any country takes time uh, there is a lot of emphasis on the environment as you know in Sri Lanka as I mentioned earlier we only have uh, uh, underground mining uh, and no open pit mining is just not allowed. And it's a pity that you're not using Zoom because if you were using Zoom, my background on the Zoom is my mine. And you know, you think it's a plantation because when you do drive up to our mine, it, it's a rubber plantation. There are rubber trees all around. And we've got a shaft on one side on the side of the hill that goes underground. And believe me, uh, the people who uh, look after and uh, are given this rubber plantation to look after one broken tree, I've got to pay them 15,000 rupees. <laughs> so it, it's important for us uh, that we maintain the environment. I think it's also important. And when we get approvals, we've got to get approvals from a variety of 15 different government departments. Uh, and I think once you get that approval in place, the government is there only to help. I think the new regime that came in about a year, year and a half ago quickly realized that they have to be a, 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 a body to provide help rather than an impediment to growth. And people like us who are non-Sri Lankans, purely in there to invest and help them upgrade their system, provide employment for their people, provide uh, you know infrastructure help when we develop uh, roads and schools and other things. 
they need people like us and and we uh, we have so far and i'll say so far always caveat that in the last four years we have only received great help from the regulator i will say though one must work with the regulator if you do not do that and you take an adversarial role you're never going to succeed in this business uh, so it's important to be uh, you know on best terms with whoever regulates your business and you know and they're there for a reason uh, and, and i have nothing but the best things to say about them in sri lanka i could give you horror stories in other countries but in sri lanka they're really very good great justin what about for element 25 you know, I'd, I'd like to think that the, the WA's reputation sort of speaks for itself. I think, you know, been mining here for a very long time as a well-trodden path to project development. Um, it's a, got a very um, sort of tried and tested mining act. Um, so as long as you follow the rules, um, it's not difficult to get a project going here. The, the, you've, got to, you've got to obviously do it by the book. Um, we've got a, a project permitted and, and in construction within 10 months of, of uh, the, the feasibility study. So. That gives you a bit of a sense of, of how quickly you can move if you're motivated and obviously the financial markets are, are there to fund it um so jurisdictionally we don't have any real concerns you know we get 20 year tenure on our mining mining lease um and yeah look there's there's lots of mining here and uh, i think most people would understand that wa is a, a tier one jurisdiction it was ranked number one in the most recent fraser institute poll on mining investment um so i'll probably leave it there there's not much more to say to that great and for Ion Energy. Thanks, uh, Justin. Dasha. Um, Mongolia is a country that, that's very often misunderstood. Uh, it's a million and a half square kilometers, three and a half million people, vastly underdeveloped, vastly underexplored. Uh, it has a, a thriving mining environment. 20% uh, of its GDP is driven by mining. It has one of the largest copper gold projects anywhere in the world, uh, funded by tier one miners uh, such as Rio Tinto. Uh, but Mongolia has been, um, uh, you know, extremely, extremely um, uh, I'd say it's, a, it's aided us tremendously in moving our projects and plans forward. We've been there over 10 years. Uh, every company that my chairman, Matthew Wood, has started in country has been primarily staffed with Mongolians, 99 to 98%, uh, because of that skilled labor source. And as a result, you build goodwill with the government. And as Bart said, it's important to work with the locals in order to uh, build that goodwill and ensure that, that you're successful. So in ION's case, very similarly, there are no expats on site. Um, in some of the other companies that we had set up historically, we had co-op agreements to provide for meat and dairy for our, our mine workers. Uh, building that goodwill and having half a board that is Mongolian obviously aids uh, as well. So we've had no challenges over the last three electoral cycles or election cycles in country. Um, they've changed uh, parties twice. It's a dem democracy. And we've had their full support uh, on an ongoing basis. In fact, uh, one of their first sovereign wealth fund investments was in a company, a sister company that's associated with ION. So uh, Mongolia is, is definitely a jurisdiction that I would say folks need to pay attention to and, and, and pay a little more attention to, for sure. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all for answering all these questions. <clears throat> We're going to open the floor to the live Q&A now. There's been a bunch of questions submitted. So um, the first question we have here is for you, Bharat. How can Cylon compete with China on graphite production scale-wise? Is it in vain limited in supply? How can you scale the business to meet the large demand of graphite that's expected to grow from companies and government? Uh, excellent question. Uh, again, a small trivia. Um, Ceylon used to be, or rather Sri Lanka, used to be the largest producer of graphite before the Second World War in the world. Obviously, that has changed now and China has taken over. Uh, yes, uh, size in, in graphite definitely matters. And if you look at our detailed plans, uh, starting first uh, with our land mass, we have 121 grids. Uh, and uh, his, our grids were selected uh, on the basis of historical production. Why? Uh, because in the past uh, and at the end of the 19th century, as you came into the 20th century, uh, all graphite mining was done in the overburden. Uh, graphite comes to the surface and people used to follow the vein in the mud or the overburden all the way up to the rock. They didn't know how to get into the rock, go to the next vein. So our hypothesis basically was where previous production has been done, there's a pretty good chance that there's graphite in the rock somewhere below down there. 
So we chose sites that had had 95% of our grids have had previous production of graphite. Uh, so effectively or theoretically, that means we could have 121 mines. But all we look at is 10 mines realistically. Uh, I'd like to keep my hair and, uh, you know, I don't think I could live that long, but I, I, we will do 10 mines. And conservatively, we say 10 mines at 5,000 tons per annum, let's say 50,000 tons of graphite per annum of 90% plus carbon. Now, yes, it's not going to matter to the Chinese graphite, but what it is going to do is it's going to give the world a huge source of high quality graphite. So just to move slightly away, who are the people who are chasing me for my graphite right now and want to have a long-term contract with me? The Chinese. Why? Because my graphite, when thrown into the barrel with their graphite, improves the quality of their graphite. So we bring to the table in the natural graphite world a huge advantage. But once we all get refined and everything else and are used for batteries, fuel cells, etc., it all becomes the same. But having said that, the quality of our product is going to give us an advantage. The low cost of our product is going to give us the other advantage. We are never going to be the shattering difference that takes business away from China. Not at all. The only thing that we're going to do in the in the in the big uh, source, of, you know, in the in the supply chain for graphite is the United States of America, as you know, has just made graphite a critical mineral. There's zero new production in this country, uh, so people are going to need graphite. Sri Lanka is going to be that bridge in the middle, I think, to be able to provide both sides of the spectrum with product. Obviously, as a true mercenary, I'm going to sell to the highest bidder. But, uh, you know, th th that's how this fits. And particularly with the big statements that all these governments are making uh, about developing uh, the whole renewable energy business, uh, Sri Lanka is going to be a big source outside of China. Yes, East Africa is going to develop. But again, they have a completely different product to what we have. Great, thank you. Justin, we have two questions about this for you. So do you think the high purity pre-visibility study will be released to the market in the first half of 2021 or the second half of 2021? Yeah, probably, probably realistically the second half. We're very focused on construction of the stage one development at the moment, and that's taking up pretty much all of our attention on a day-to-day -day basis that obviously should come to a close in the, at the end of the first quarter of, of this year. Um, we'll then turn our attention very much to the high purity side of things and start putting that business plan together. Um, but that's probably going to take longer than one quarter, I would suspect. So I'd, I'd expect to see that in the, in, in the third or fourth quarter of this year. Great, thank you. Robert is asking, where does the Redox Flow battery fit into the charging of EVs? Anyone? Feel free to. Yeah, so let, let me take a shot at that and then uh, pass it on to my, 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 my co-panelists uh, here. Uh, it's, first of all, uh, 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 those batteries are not commercially being used as yet. They're all uh, batteries that, there are so many ideas uh, of, of different uh, kinds of, uh, of, of batteries that are available uh, in today's market. Batteries, it's funny, but the batteries that are actually being used the most are almost the simplest batteries that are available. The more complex they get, the old adage, keep it simple. The more complex the battery gets, it's not easy to commercially manufacture all, all these batteries. And everybody asks me, you know, oh, when's battery, where, where solid state batteries are coming in, this, that, and the other, your product's going to become obsolete. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but at least over the next, I'd say 10 to 15 years, current technology is not going to change that much. And we are going to stay with basic uh, batteries. Uh, Ali mentioned, uh, you know, the, there are some differences from the lithium ion and the lithium phosphates uh, that are going on, uh, around with Tesla, but even that is not such a dramatically different product. It's the same base product being maybe covered or coated with a different veneer. Gentlemen. 
yeah, I'm not aware of any, any anyone who sort of uses the vanadium flow battery as a solution for EVs. I think it's more seen as a, as a, a grid storage technology if, if and when it comes to, to commercial production. Um, it's it's an interesting product. It's not, not one that I'm an expert on by any stretch. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. Uh, it is primarily used in storage and it is quite bulky, so I can't imagine it being in an EV, so to speak, but uh, not my forte. All right. Uh, this next question is, how do you fan finance your operations? So um, they don't specify which company, so <laughs> we can all just... I'll start off since you always uh, ask me first. So what we have done uh, so far and to date is uh, purely uh, we financed ourselves on an equity basis. Uh, and uh, all the money we've raised, we raised uh, uh, initially through, you know, the, the, we, we went, uh, we did, when we moved into this business, we did a reverse takeover of a shell on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And we've gone to the public markets uh, to, to raise the money. Uh, at a certain stage, uh, given the, the way the world has moved up and down, you know, after 2008, uh, when the credit markets basically collapsed, uh, banks won't lend any money. Uh, things have changed now, and there's a lot of liquidity in the markets, and people want to lend money. So I suppose uh, companies like ours now will start taking uh, a bit of uh, debt on. You've got to be careful that you maintain the correct balance. Uh, too much debt and too many fancy currencies uh, will kill you. Uh, and, uh, you know, there might be no no interest in yen, but the yen volatility is so strong. And again, you know, it depends on what your sales are in and stuff like that. So there's there a lot of complications to that. But yes, the banks are beginning to show some interest. Uh, but I think more and more one has to uh, look at the equity markets. A lot of the development banks who used to help out in mining, for some reason, don't want to touch mining now because uh, the, the non-government NGOs are pressurizing them to stay away from upsetting the environment and the earth. And you know, one can agree with them, but also disagree with them. A lot of us follow mining practices that are of the highest standards. And if you look at our website, and today we've issued a press release on our ESG standards and policies, and you know, you'll see that it is something that all of us pay a lot of attention to. So, you know, hopefully uh, the money flows improve and uh, we, we, we get more capital because if one has more capital, one can grow one's business quite dramatically. All right, Justin, did you want to add anything? Yeah, we, we, we followed a very similar path to, to the one Barat described. So we've raised our funding through equity with a small convertible note with our offtake partner. Um, so we're, we've got very low levels of gearing. Um, and you know we would look to potentially take on some debt as we expand the business um, under the right terms. Um, but yeah, I couldn't agree. You got to you got to watch those gearing levels because, especially when you're trading multiple currencies, it can become quite challenging to manage the risks. So in our case, we're very similar. Uh, friends and family founded, uh, and then we went out and did an equity raise. Uh, we raised plenty of capital to, to ensure our operations are are, are covered. Uh, we are a low lean operating company, so we're, we're not uh, you know expending capital left, right, and center. Uh, in addition to that, I think we have some warrants that uh, we'll be converting in the short order that'll help recapitalize the company. Uh, but in essence, uh, equity markets is where we get our capital. Great, thank you. Um, just another question about manganese. What are the other uses of manganese in the industries? So I touched on that a little bit before. It's, it's the traditional use is primarily steel. So basically about 90% of the global manganese market goes into steel. Um, there's also a number of sort of slightly more exotic alloys, aluminium cans use some manganese, um, various other sort of aerospace alloys use manganese as well. Um, and that's kind of been, and I guess, and traditional batteries, so Duracell sort of cells use use manganese oxide in the uh, in, in the manufacture. Um, and the lithium ion is, is sort of the newest segment of the, of the market that's expected to become more and more important in coming years. Great, thank you. Um, Krishna is asking, where can we use low-grade graphite? So that's for you, bro. Uh, you know, low-grade graphite uh, can be used all over the place. Uh, graphite is used, uh, as I mentioned, in a, in, in a, in a variety of, uh, of products. Uh, but uh, you can start off uh, to just take something that Justin said a few minutes ago, the lower-grade batteries 
uh, like Duracell, the big 4D battery uh, that uses uh, 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 graphite, and you don't have to refine the graphite as much to put it into into that product. Uh, you can use it uh, for when you need it as a uh, lubricant. Uh, and the military are the big buyers of the lowest quality battery because uh, what, I'm sorry, lowest quality graphite because they can use uh, that uh, for, for, for their lubrication purposes. Uh, just one thing to keep in mind, uh, when you talk about low quality graphite, you're still talking about graphite 80, 85% carbon content. And most of the world, the graphite is not there. In most of the world, you get 10 to 30 percent carbon content graphite. So, certain amount of concentration has to be done to bring it even to that level. Great. Thank you so much. Well, so that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank you to this incredible panel for joining us and taking us through the live Q&A. I also want to thank everyone who submitted questions. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question or if you think of one after this summit, we will be emailing you out a survey where you can leave your contact details and the companies uh, will reach out to you directly. So thank you again so much to Ali, Barat, Justin for joining us today and for all your great insights. Um, I'll just pass it back for you to send any closing remarks. Well, you know, you got to make the pitch uh, for your company. Uh, Ceylon Graphite is a great company. It's got a great future. Uh, come and visit us in idyllic Sri Lanka, and we can take you several hundred uh, feet at our mine underground, uh, and you'll be very safe. Uh, and please invest in our company. Uh, we will be providing a critical product uh, to the global energy storage business. Uh, and uh, come uh, join us in the ride. Good. Justin, any final statement? Yeah, last, I guess last words. We we're on. A, we think we're on a really exciting journey uh, as well. Um, I'm I'm a city mid shareholder of the company. I'm I'm backing the journey we're on. Um, I'd encourage you to take a closer look if you think that uh, what I've said today is, is of interest to you. Um, and I'll just close by saying thanks to you, Dasha and and Barat and Ali for uh, a very interesting panel. Thank you. Nally? Yeah, you know, I'd echo everything uh, everybody else has said, but uh, importantly, you know, Ion Energy is poised to be a, a global leader in, in the supply of lithium to the largest market in the world, that being China, only 24 kilometers away. We're trading on the TSX under ticker Ion. We're trading on the OTC under Ion GF, and we're in Frankfurt under 5YB. I encourage you to visit our website and uh, follow our story. Great things to come. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day or night if you're in Australia.